Yeah. You know, 2020 is almost in the rearview mirror, and that's good. <laughs> it had been kind of an interesting year, but we've got to ask 2,200 years from what? Well, from Jesus' life. When Jesus walked here on planet Earth, you know, you can't open a newspaper, you can't look at a calendar without knowing when it is, when it is from the time of Jesus Christ. I think about the, the Library of Congress. Library of Congress has over 17,000 volumes written about Jesus, and most of those volumes have been written in the last 30 years, far more than the 19 centuries past. You know, think about this. Uh, for those of you, uh, Daryl, I'll mention you, stand out on the golf course. And uh, I'm not saying you do this, so you probably don't. I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't have named you in the first place, but think about this. You probably hear guys that miss a putt. They miss that putt, and all of a sudden, you hear what? Well, you don't hear the name of Mahatma Gandhi or George Washington. You hear the name of somebody else. And that somebody, of course, we, we know. I don't even have to say it. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote an interesting thing. He said, the name of Jesus is not as much written as it is plowed into the history of the world. Plowed into the history of the world. You think about this. He was born 20 centuries ago in a really a, a tiny, obscure little village. Uh, he never traveled outside of his region. He never wrote a book. He never commanded an army. He, he never controlled a nation. He never even had a home. Never even had a home. And, but the Romans thought he was important enough, certain Romans anyway, that they even talked about his execution, his crucifixion, which normally they did not do. You know, what are the odds, 2,000 years, that the name is responsible for the more creation of art, for more songs than any other person in all of history? Think about that. What what is about that name? More than any other name, people will travel across the world. They'll travel across the globe. They'll give up their finances. They'll virtually give up their lives for this name. What, what is in this name? You know, you think about this and think about what, what God has done, his memory, his life. It, it isn't gone away. While, while atheists would hope that it goes away, it's only growing and it continues to grow. Who, we say, is this man Jesus Christ? Yeah, what does he mean to me? What does he mean to you? Well, you know, <laughs> he was so compelling. Why is he so compelling still? And there's many snapshots we might see of Jesus. We, we understand, and really one of the things we should understand, Jesus was a rabbi. Fourteen times in the Bible. And you know, if you brought your Bibles today, think about this. You might look it up after our, after our meeting, but 14 times he's called rabbi. Now, other, other versions actually even have more times. Also, 40 times he's called a teacher. Understand now that nobody could just walk around and, and call themselves a rabbi. <laughs> nobody could do that. This is the one thing we need to understand about Jesus today. Rabbi was a profession. It stands for accountability. It meant something. And for a young boy growing up in Israel, you think about this, to be a rabbi was the greatest thing that could happen. <laughs> the greatest thing he could do. Greatest thing that could, could come to him. It was the greatest passion was to know Torah. Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And people living in Israel weren't distinguished because they were, well, the whole nation really, they weren't distinguished because they were a great people. They weren't distinguished because they had a, a monster army. They weren't distinguished because they had great wealth. No, they were distinguished because they knew the God of the universe. That's what set them apart from every other nation. So to know Torah, to teach Torah, to, to be a rabbi, well, <laughs> that was what every young man in Israel wanted. Here's a, an ancient saying around the time of Jesus. Listen to this. It says, under the age of six, we do not receive a pupil. But from six upward, we accept him and we stuff him with Torah like an ox. Stuff him with Torah like an ox. Stuff him with, with the word of God like an ox. So you cram as much scripture as you can into the kid. And at around age six, a little boy would go to what's called Beth Safer. Beth Safer. It means what does it mean? I lost it. There it is. 
the house of the book, the house of the book. That's what they would join as a little boy. They would begin to study Torah. They would begin to look at it, read it, and understand it. From the age of six till 10, the little boy then would, would sit at the feet of his teacher. I think about the apostle Paul. Remember, he said he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. As a young boy, he did the same thing, growing up and up and up. Now, from the dawn of the afternoon, from the dawn of the morning, I mean, till the afternoon, he would study Torah. He would try and memorize and chant Torah. Matter of fact, the rabbis had a, a cool thing, I think. They would take a little bit of honey, and they put it on the tongue of every one of their little pupils. Why? Sweetest thing you can imagine. And they wanted to associate God's word with the sweetest thing you can imagine, the honey. Think about that. Um, more to be desired than honey oil than the honeycomb. Where did that come from? Well, they, they apparently got those words and they applied it in a real physical way. You think about this, from age 10 and upward then, they, they'd done all of this. They, they put it all together. You see, there was no copies. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't go to a, a hotel or a motel in Jesus' day and find a Gideon Bible. It wasn't there. No copies whatsoever. So they had to learn it and they had to repeat it. It was an oral repetition of everything that was going on. Now, but these students, when they reach that age then of uh, past 10, you think of, well, 10, I think it was the, the Beth Talmud. Thinking to the Beth Talmud, it meant the house of learning. Now, these were the, the best kids, the best studies. They, well, what can I say? They, they just yearned and hungered for more. The brightest and the best. The brightest and the best. Do we think about that today as we study, as we learn, as we look, and as we listen? Um, do we seek for that special gift, that sweeter than honey scripture in our mouths? Do we, do we yearn for a greater understanding of God? Do we think it's the most special thing in our lives? Do we think it's the, the most wonderful thing in our lives? You see, they continued then until they were about 14 years old. And at 14, in that age, they, they begin to look even more and deeper in the scripture. They begin to understand a little more. And the rabbis would ask them certain questions. They'd test their knowledge, test their understanding. They'd ask certain questions. And for instance, they didn't think in a linear fashion, in a straight fashion. They would ask them a question, what's two by two, or two times two, and or two plus two. And the young man would answer, perhaps, uh, well, it's the square root of 16 showing that they had a deeper understanding, a deeper knowledge in, in more areas, in more ways. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's just a little side note, but you know, I worked for, with Doug Batchelor for many years and, and Doug is Jewish. And Doug doesn't think like a lot of other people. You probably noticed that in, in the things he, he talks about and the way he looks at scripture. I've got another friend, um, um, he, he wrote for many years for Review and Herald, another Jewish fellow, same way totally looks at scripture and, and looks at these things in, a, in a, a, a different way than we might think of it now. I believe God gave them a special blessing, a special gift, a special gift of knowledge and understanding. And as the whole nation, as they were raised up as little children to know the scriptures, the scriptures are able to do what? Make you wise unto salvation. The scriptures are able to train you up to, to guide you in certain directions. And I believe that God blessed that nation in a very special way. Unfortunately, that people as a nation wandered away from God, but individually, we can all still come to God today. Every one of us, we can have that knowledge, we can have that understanding. Now, a snapshot of Jesus, if you will, if you're going through the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus asked questions kind of in the same way he, as a rabbi, he asked questions such as, well, what, what work is permitted on the Sabbath? Or how do you honor your mother and father? He always put these questions out so they they cause people to think, hmm, maybe I never thought about that, or I never thought about it in this way. But now by the age of 14, these young men, they would have memorized virtually all the Old Testament. And the young men then would come and they'd say to a rabbi, can I be one of your Talmudim or apprentice? 
the rabbis never went to them. They never came to them and said, join me. No, no, no. They, they uh, kind of, what's the word? They were too astute for that. They were too learned and knowledgeable. And it was only those who came to them. And the rabbi would give them a little test then. And he'd ask them, well, maybe this question or this question or that question. And if they answered appropriately, if they answered in a good way, he would accept them into the house of study or the, the Bet Mishra, I think it's called. I actually called a friend of mine who studies Hebrew a lot and a couple of things. Anyway, you'll have to look it up, but it's, I'll spell it for you. It's M-I-D-R-A-S-H, Midrash, perhaps, but they pronounce things a little bit different way. But then they'd ask, you know, do you know Torah? Have you memorized Torah? Are you able to interpret it properly? And if a young man was really good enough, you know, okay. But most of them, most of them were not. And this is what the rabbi would say to them. Yeah, it's obvious you love God. And it's obvious you love his word. But you don't have what it takes to be one of my Talmudian. So go home, be happy, raise a family, love God, and just be a good person in a godly life. In other words, go away. <laughs> you just don't have what it takes. You flunked. Just the best of the best of the best of the best. That's what they were looking for. Just that kind of upper crust. Now, to be accepted by a, you know, a rabbi in Jesus' day, that was it. I mean, that was absolutely it. You, you became Talmudian. You made the grade. But the goal was not not just information from the rabbi. Their goal, you see, was to follow that rabbi everywhere, to become exactly like that rabbi. What the rabbi did, they would do. What the rabbi said, they would say. How the rabbi acted, that's how they would act. <laughs> and I, I, here's another one too. I, I don't know how far and wide this may go, this uh, sermon message, but I, know, I don't think anybody will take offense at it, but uh, Mark Finley, Mark is a good example because it still happens today. Many young people, I've watched many young people that come around Mark Finley and study is every word. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it because Mark is tremendous at what he does. He knows scripture inside out. He knows how to call people to the Lord. He's got it nailed. And so he teaches many classes and many young people. And I've watched these young people over the years. You can, you can pick them out in a group as they're doing evangelism, say, there's a Mark Finley clone. There's another Mark Finley clone because they have the same mannerisms on stage. They say some of the same things. The way the inflection is, they got it from Mark. And it's very interesting. That's the way these young, young men did as they watched and they followed their rabbi. They took on all the characteristics of the rabbi. Now, Jesus reflected this in his teachings he said this in Luke 6.40. Let me get my Bible here. It says, no disciple, that's Talmudian. No disciple is above his master, that's a rabbi. But every disciple, when fully trained, will be like his master. Jesus understood this. Jesus fully understood this. And these young men, they would follow their rabbi any place at all, any place and every place. Matter of fact, it's kind of interesting, you know, I've had some interesting times myself and, and uh, people following you, you know, they see some of the programs I've done and they want to kind of go around. I've been in the Philippines and like, they'll follow you right in the bathroom <laughs> to take a photo or something, kind of crazy things. But one fellow went to Israel and he found it was the same with the rabbis, o only more so. If the rabbi went to the bathroom, the young fellow followed because the rabbi may say a prayer while he's there. He, he may some, say some bit of wisdom as he's praying to God, and they didn't want to miss it at all. Didn't want to miss it at all. And so we tend to compartmentalize God. You and I, we, we tend to put God in this little box and say, okay, God, over here. This is your spot over here, and, and this is all my life over here. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in what was happening with the rabbis. As these young men followed them, they wanted to emulate everything. They wanted to get every little bit of wisdom that fell from their lips, 
everything that happened. They wanted to gather that up, every fragment that scripture says, that nothing be lost. Nothing be lost. Now, back then to know Torah, in every era of life and everything, that was just everything. To know scripture, that was absolutely everything. And Jesus, remember, was a rabbi. Not just any rabbi. He came upon the scene and he just didn't teach. You see, he, he began to do things with power, with absolute power. He was a rabbi that had power. That was something totally different. You see, in Torah, God gave the commandment to Moses to pray about or to uh, prayer shawls. And so over time, they began making prayer shawls. And, and the priests, they represented, you know, the tassels and the blue tassels. They represented the, the priest. God wanted them to understand it was a, a generation, a, a, a whole family of priests. Well, all Jewish men, even to the time of Jesus, would wear these shawls with the tassels to represent they were a kingdom of priests. Probably, we don't know for sure, but there's a very good chance that Jesus also wore one of those shawls, especially as Rabbi Jesus. And there's many texts that we find. Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, here is one of the, the, the most wealthy people in Israel, one of the, one of the high crust, uh, one of the, the upper teachers of Israel. And he calls Jesus Rabbi. So we think that Jesus probably had a prayer shawl. And it's interesting in Malachi, I'm going to read another scripture to you here. Malachi 4.2 says, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Hmm, think about that. The son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And the word in Malachi for wings is karnarf. Karnarf. Now, think about that for a moment. The karnarf is the same as you know, the prayer shawl. The corners of the prayer shawl where the tassels are attached is called karnarf. Malachi says, the son of righteousness shall arise with healings in his karnarf, in the ends of his prayer shawl. Now we go to the New Testament. And we look in the New Testament. You remember the woman that suffered uh, for 12 years. 12 years this lady suffered with pain and, and an issue of blood, which kept her out of the temple. It kept her out of everything associated with people. She was unclean. And she says one day in her heart, she hears about Jesus. She says one day in her heart, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Where did she get that? Where, where did that come from? I tend to think it came from Malachi. She connected Malachi with Jesus Christ. She connected that healing in his wings with Jesus, the rabbi, who she knew had power, and if she could but touch that, that edge of that karnarf, she would be healed. <laughs> and we know as Jesus is walking through that crowd that day, he's pressed by hundreds and hundreds of people. I think about that situation. I was in India one time, and, and uh, uh, it was just amazing as people would press into you just by the hundreds and hundreds and want you to lay your hand upon their heads for prayer. And could you tell who was pressing you? I mean, they were pressing from all sides. And Jesus stops in that procession and he said, who touched me? <laughs> who touched me? And the disciples kind of like, probably me. And say, Lord, you can look at, at this whole crowd. Everybody's pressing in on you. Say, who touched me? But you see, this was the touch of faith. This woman understood, I believe, Malachi. She understood that Jesus is the one who had healing in his wings. And she was ready to reach out and grab a hold of that in faith. And she touched him, and Jesus perceived that that healing virtue went out of him. And he turns and he says to her, daughter, <laughs> daughter. Now, he had never called anybody that in Scripture. He says this one, daughter, you've been made whole. Well, if she'd still been had all of her problems, just being called daughter by Jesus Christ would have sufficed. But God knows our inner hearts. He knows our inner needs, and he just doesn't leave with half a blessing. <laughs> he wants to give us the full plate. He wants to give it to us, every bit of it. This woman went away 
rejoicing. She was completely healed. Now, this healing has been going on for 2,000 years. This very healing, you know, people who are addicts, people who are brokenhearted, people who've got so many troubles piled up on top of them, guilt-ridden, lonely, and, and the list goes on and on. You know we're in the midst of a that crazy pandemic and all these things, and the list is piles and piles and piles. There's more suicides than there's maybe ever been. There's more pornography and there's more alcoholism. It, it all is piling on top of us, but Jesus has healing in his wings. Jesus can heal us. And, you know, it can happen to you. It can happen to me today. It has happened to me. Praise God, it has happened to me. And if you haven't experienced that, it can happen to you too. I think about Jesus many times is called certain things in the Bible, so many different things. You know, he's called the master of life. Master of life, but he's called the bread of life, the deliverer, the good shepherd, the king of kings, lord of lords. He's called the door, the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the door for a marvelous life in him for you. Choose him this day. You know, he walks up to some and he says, follow me. Follow me. And they drop whatever they're doing. Remember, Rabbi never recruited anybody. But hmm, Jesus was different. Jesus was different. You see, Jesus went about looking and seeking those. And Jesus' day, only the best of the best, remember, were accepted in the rabbi school. But Jesus goes out to James and John. What are James and John doing anyway? Yeah, well, I can't hear you tonight, but they're fishing, right? You remember, they're fishing. They're, they're sewing dad's nets and they're doing all these things. What does that mean? Well, it means they're a washout. <laughs> they flunked out of the school of the rabbis. The rabbi said, go home, kids. You're good kids. You know, Mary, go to your dad's work and, and be good kids and love God. They're kicked out of school. That's it. They weren't smart enough. They, they, didn't, they weren't spiritual enough. They, they didn't make the cut. <laughs> they gave up the dream to, to know Torah, to, to do Torah, to, to be part of the Talmudim with the rabbis. They lost their dream. They lost it all. Dad probably didn't feel too good either because for a parent, that was, oh, that was it. Oh, but Jesus showed up. You know, the rabbi comes. He comes to them, the rabbi. They've heard about this rabbi. And he's got, he's got power. He's got standing. He's got healing in his wings. He talks of God. He, he makes everyone's heart melt. The rabbi comes to these rabbi dropouts and says, follow me. To these rejects, he says, follow me. You, you, and you, all of you, come, follow me. Follow me. James and John still working with their dad. They know they're not rabbi material. They've washed out. They, they know they're not spiritual enough. They feel pretty bad about it all. They've, they've tried over time. They've tried to put it out of their minds. That's why they're, you know, they're probably sewing nets harder and they're fishing harder. They're doing all these things harder. And then the rabbi speaks to them, you know, I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe you have what it takes to, to deal with all this. Come, follow me. I'll show you the way. I'll give you all of my knowledge. I'll give you all of my understanding. I'll give you my power. I, who have healing in my wings, will change your thoughts and your perceptions about yourselves. What must that have been like? when they're there and Jesus is speaking to them, telling them, I believe in me, believe in me, not in yourselves because you flunked out, but believe in me. I see, I see what you can become. I see what you can become. And you see today, the same thing can happen with us. You know, they left their nets. They believed in God and they became the disciples and then they in turn became the rabbis and went and sought more disciples. God comes to each one of us. He knocks at our doors. And what is our choice? I think about, uh, I'll share something with you. I've, I've never 
really shared, I don't think, out. But uh, when I was working in Amazing Facts uh, about that time period, uh, kind of the, the end of my journey there, I had three calls, amazing calls to various ministries, two of them in California. One was in another area. Uh, but while I was working in Amazing Facts, I need to go back for a second. While I was working in Amazing Facts, uh, Janine didn't come with me to Sacramento. She stayed in Mount Shasta. And I would try and finish up work on a Thursday evening. I'd uh, floor the car <laughs> and I'd get up to Mount Shasta in pretty quick time Thursday night. And then I'd spend Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and I'd leave Sunday back for work. Did that for about three years or so. Janine always kind of stayed here once in a great while. She'd come down. I had an apartment down there. And, uh, but she really wanted to, you know, stay home with the kids and the family and the horses and, and all that stuff. Well, three calls. This one day, Janine comes in. Honey, it's uh, Dr. Schoen. He wants to talk to you. Dr. Schoen, I've, I've met him before. He works at the General Conference. I talk with him for almost an hour. When I hang up the phone, Janine says, that's where we're supposed to go. That's where we're supposed to go. How do you know that? I just really feel God is impressing me. That's where we're supposed to go. Now, that is where we eventually went. We spent another two weeks praying and looking and talking with all the ministries. That is where we went. And guess what? My wife left her children. She left her grandkids. She left her horses, which are were extremely all of our married life, very important. And she left her beautiful home, left all of that because she felt the call of God on her heart. <sighs> Rabbi comes to you, says, I want you to be my Talmudim. I want to change your life. I want this to be your most important goal. I want you to do that for me question is, you know, will you follow him? Will you do that? Will you make that sacrifice? Let me tell you, it, there was times for us that definitely wasn't easy. There were other times when it was such an incredible blessing, but it won't always be easy. It wasn't easy for Abram to leave at 75 years old and go out to some country he had no idea. It wasn't easy for Moses. It wasn't easy for those others and say, well, wait, 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 Jim, you know, those were guys really high up in the Bible. No, no, no. Those were just individual people like you and like me. God puts a call on each one of our lives. Peter, James, and John, all these guys were just normal people. Matthew was a tax collector making lots of money. He let it all sit right there, left it all, because he heard that calling. He, he caught the vision of what God would do in his life. He could be far more than a tax collector. James and John, they could be far more than fishers of fish. God was going to make them fishers of men, which is the greatest, the greatest job you can have in all the universe. And God is calling you right now. Come, come, follow me. Join me. Come to my school. I'll make you more than you could ever believe possible. Who is this man? <laughs> Who is this man, Jesus? He's the king of the universe. He's the God of the universe. He's the one who laid down his life for you and for me. He did it all for you and for me. Now, there's a, a great prayer. As I kind of wrap this up for you as you think about this, there's a great prayer that goes back to Jesus's day. And it was a blessing that was given to Talmudian about their rabbi. And it went like this. May you follow your rabbi so closely that when his sandals kicked up dust, you are so close to him that the dust covers you. Think about that visual. May you never be out of his sight. May you never be someplace where you can't hear him speak to you. May you fall so deeply in love with him that nothing, no trial, no problem, no heartache will ever separate you from his side. What a, what a beautiful thought. Will you make that commitment today to, to be with Jesus Christ, to follow him like that, to follow him as your rabbi, that you follow him so closely that the dust he kicks up will be right there and it'll be falling all over you because you will never, you will never leave his side. 
Choose him today. Let's pray. Father, oh Lord, uh, please help us to, uh, to really see Rabbi Jesus as we should. The one who's coming to our business, the one who's coming to our home, calling us, saying, please, there's so much more for you. I believe in you. I will change you. I will lift you up higher and higher and higher. I will make you royalty in my kingdom. Please know each and every heart right now. Thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, everybody, and God bless.